our hope for theater and, and see the, the absence of the thing and know what it is, which was a real gift to me in terms of talking to you, but talking to all of us. But when I talked about them, you said that you wish that they were better. Mm -hmm. And so why, how, and how would you, and how about you know the third volume, or like what would be different now if you were to? Yeah. Uh, I'm always cheered when, when uh, these, uh, they were originally commissioned starting back in 1994, uh, production notebooks, uh, Anne Catania, you know, the great, great Anne Catania, uh, uh, dramaturg Lincoln Center, two-time president, maybe even three-time president, I forget, of uh, Literary Managers and Dramaturgs of the Americas commissioned uh, me to do something. And I said I wanted to create the, a series of production notebooks and commission eight dramaturgs to respond to productions they were working on. And, and I think everybody thought, well, it's going to be just all about dramaturgs and, and uh, heightening the profiles of dramaturgs, be an advertisement for dramaturgs. I never thought it was going to be that. I never wanted it to be that. I wanted it to be something larger. I wanted it to be about uh, investigation of process. I wanted to look at great artists and, and, and uh, everybody from Robert Wilson to someone like Robert LaPage, who I admired tremendously. Uh, and I, I didn't want it to be something that was about, how look how great these artists are. I wanted it to be a look at the process, the detours, the mistakes, and, and how that works. Uh, in retrospect, uh, and indeed, earlier today uh, uh, at this conference, Eric N said something quite amazing, quite astonishing. Uh, he, he used the amazing phrase uh, that uh, theater, perhaps our work as artists, uh, as teachers, as mentors, uh, as students of the theater, can be something about the preservation of the imprecise. And I, I wish to hell, uh, you know, when I was doing, uh, putting together these production notebooks and publishing them, that I had had that uh, uh, phrase to put at the front of the book, that these, these documents represent the preservation of the imprecise the detours, the mistakes, because after all, that's how you learn something as artists. And um, I think that's it uh, in many ways. Looking back, uh, what most people don't know, people like uh, Lee Sam Johnson who did the, uh, who, uh, this amazing soul, traveled all the way over to Germany, to Munich, and uh, spent six weeks with Robert Lepage. Followed him around, and that's no mean feat. Uh, <laughs> and sent me back 200 typewritten pages of interviews and things. And I had to edit it down to 60, 70 pages. Because theater communications group said, well, you, you, you know, it can't be a tome. Uh, and what I had to cut away was, was hard. It was fascinating. It was even, would have been even more useful, even more meaningful detours. And that's what I mean, I, uh, my regrets. That's what was hard. You know, I, I, I just was so hard. Someday I'll send that to Jeff Grohl at the uh, University of Puget Sound and say, here it is, this is what got cut away. Uh, but uh, that, that's what I mean, and, and uh, that my regret about that. But uh, my, my, my greatest triumph, though, I think, it's so funny. Uh, again, it's not about the dramaturgs. It's not about the dramaturgs. It's not about the dramaturgs. I think my greatest pleasure was I was working with Moises Kaufman at one point uh, for five years. At one point, he said for five years. Uh, uh, on the, first on the American premiere at the Arena Stage, and then at the Hoya Playhouse premiere, and then on Broadway, and then for 20 weeks in workshops. And at one point, for three weeks at the University of Illinois Urbana, uh, we were uh, doing a workshop. Uh, because there was a Beethoven scholar there. Uh, and uh, so we were there. And uh, I was sitting there at a performing arts center where we were going to work on it. And I was sitting in this immense stage management office. And I looked up 
And there were two volumes of the production notebook there. The big stage manager office. And I sat there and went. <laughs> <laughs> and I quietly said to this resident stage manager, uh, I, uh, what, what, do you, what do you have the production notebooks here for? And she didn't know I was Mark Bly. <laughs> she didn't know I was a celebrity. And uh, <laughs> how could she? You're a man of your And uh, and uh, at any rate, so I said, what do you have that for? And she said, oh, well, you know, we have a stage management program here, and we use that to teach the stage management students all about process. Mm -hmm. It teaches them, you know, nothing is easy. There are no perfect productions, and this is the way it works, and don't expect it to work that way. Mm -hmm. The preservation of the imprecise. And I was so happy at that moment because I understood that I'd done something far, far larger than promoted the, the, the profession of dramaturgy. Something far larger than promoted the dramaturgical gesture. That, and that mattered. Oh. Uh, speaking of Eric Ann. We all do every day. We every do. <laughs> Let's, let's get in our Doctor Who TARDIS and go back in time uh, to uh, uh, Vancouver 11 years ago. Uh, I understand that Eric N. said something at the last LMDA conference 11 years ago that meant a great deal to you. Uh, he said that theater was uncovering the dead and reconstructing a history for a community. And theater is a survivor's narrative, told concisely, without pity, but with hope. And that this is something that you have as a sampler. Yeah, I do. I, um, and I finally got to tell Eric that yesterday, after, which is why this whole weekend's been really terrifying for me. Um, I, it was, you just don't know when the creator's going to give you the gift, right? Like that, that conference, um, things I've noted, that conference, the last time LMD I was here in Vancouver, we were at SFU, but we were up the hill on the mountain. We're up on the mountain. And this time we are not. We are down here, still SFU, amongst the people, um, really, really amongst the people. So there's been an interesting shift in perspective, I think. Which, is, which is, parallels the thing that we're all talking about, about wanting to be more with the people. And, you know, Kendra talking about this morning about um, I am my audience, uh, making that connection for us. I had, I had not taken Native Earth yet. What year was that? 2002. So I had been appointed, but I had not actually taken Native Earth yet. And, uh, mm -hmm. And then I went to hear Eric speak at the, I think he did the keynote, and he, he's fixed that by now. He speaks way too fast to actually take notes, um, so we can't quote him anymore. Um, but in, in his speaking, he said many, many smart and resonant things that for me over the, over the days, but in that, in that first speak, he said those two things, and I wrote them down, not knowing how important they were actually going to be to me. And then I stuck them to above my desk um, at Native Earth, and then I stuck them above my desk at home, and then I stuck them above my desk in Saskatoon, and now I have sort of those two quotes everywhere. But just going into Native Earth, those two ideas have huge resonance because we as Aboriginal people have been so disappeared here for so long. And I, at, at this point, I do have to take a, an instant to honor my colleagues who put the conference together and thought of me, um, thought of including me in something so um, high profile, momentous, important as a conversation like this with you, but also in the whole conference because it's not been, it's not been common to be remembered to be seen. I mean, it's, you know, the Dean Swift, right? The vision is the art of seeing things mm -hmm. invisible. And uh, it's amazing to sort of, it's like my cloak of invisibility just fell off and mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, 
So those two things that Eric said that I was able to clip and put above my desk offered me a way to continue having faith in the work that I was doing at Native Earth, where really we are sort of unearthing mm -hmm. the dead and reconstructing a history for a community whose history has been buried under a series of things. Uh, the people who are the settlers who arrived and, and the, the white papers and the residential school and aren't we tired of the residential school? Well, yeah, the last one closed 17 years ago. So yeah, we should be over it by now. These, these are, and, and so unearthing these things and then looking at them in a way through art, through a contemporary practice is hard work. And sometimes I have to remember other people who do that hard work and how they do it. And that I'm not alone. And that I'm not, it's not just me and it's not just Aboriginal people. There are people all over the place doing the work, that work. And so those, and also, you know, I wish I'd said that. Like it's just that thing of when you find the things that you, when people have said something that I wish I'd said that, I wish I'd written that. Mm -hmm. And I wish I had said those things, but they were a touchstone for me. They continue to be a touchstone for me. They're going to have to continue because he spoke too fast this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Mark. You better go. Um. Uh, well, I have another thing. Uh, you've written a play recently called uh, The Unplugging that's set in a, a, a post-apocalyptic world. There's two extraordinary women who've been exiled from their community uh, and who are surviving in the wilderness and they have special abilities that the rest of this civilization doesn't have. How did you write this play? What, what, what was the spark for this? <laughs> There's many. Um, I, had, I wrote the unplugging. It's, the story was originally called Two Old Women. Um, which it, Kugler had given me a book uh, called Two Old Women that was a retelling of an Athabascan story uh, by, that Velma Wallace retold about two old women pre-contact who, um, who are banished from their community in a time of need and have to go inside and learn, relearn their traditional, what they know, their traditional knowledge in order to survive. And they thrive. And then the community comes back to them and asks them to rejoin the community. And I don't really believe in this world. So uh, the only way that I could imagine us healing ourselves was to sort of wipe it clean and start over again. So in the unplugging, the two old women are not really old. They're like 50 and 60. And what has happened is that the lights have gone out and not come back on. And these two old women are banished because they're no longer childbearing age and you know they're useless. Because I was also becoming... Um, my second cloak of invisibility, I was becoming a woman of a certain age. And, uh, and my mother died quite young, of, uh, and she was invisible because she was a little old Indian lady, and so she was invisible. And so that was something that I was working out um, about what our value is as women after we are not mothers. And, and so that's where that story came from, but I couldn't imagine us healing until I got rid of most of the world. And then the two old women in this case remember what they know, how to trap rabbits, where how to get water, how to build community. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's why I wrote the play. And then the, miraculously, Rachel Deiter at the Arts Club championed the play and the Arts Club produced it last year uh, in October. And it was such a gift because it's the first time that I didn't have to market it or make a prop or raise the money or mm -hmm. um, do any of those things. It was really, literally the first time a play of mine premiered with someone else's resources like that. Mm. Um, but it was a play, it's a play that is that we, we did in a theater, um, hence my you know, desire to have a little more time in theaters like this with the lights and the, the control. I like control over mm. everything. Mm -hmm. I didn't find it, I mean it is, it's a play I'm very proud of and I'm very grateful to have received and been able to do and is being published um, but it's a pretty traditional play in terms of theater right 
And one of the things that we've been talking about this weekend is risk. risk. What kind of a risk? I mean, yeah. it was a risk for the arts club. So much of a risk, actually, that they asked me to change the title because uh, they couldn't market to old women. Um, so they asked me to change the title, so we changed the title to The Unplugging, um, which I don't know if that was easier to market or not. <laughs> Total sense. I know, right? I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm grateful. Yeah, um, however, you know, we've been talking about what we've seen that excites us. Mm -hmm. I was excited by that for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, what have we seen? Like, what, what kind of theater? What are we, what are we doing with our form? Have you know? Have you seen anything? Is it like what's excited you in the theater? When I asked you, you said you gave me a bunch of books that you're reading about neuroscience. Oh yeah, the project um, that you're doing with Tectonic Theater. Yeah, I uh, I've been starting. Uh, I just only recently um, have gotten involved in sort of a tangential way, just in formative stages. Uh, Moises, I have this uh, relationship with Moises Kaufman. It's just again very tangential. Uh, I was invited to uh, watch some early uh, scenes that have been uh, they, they're working on. Andy and Anushka Parrish, longtime members of the Tectonic Theater Company in New York, uh, founded obviously by Moises Kopp and some other folks. Uh, I attended this reading and then had a, 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 had a series of discussions with the pl playwrights and directors. It's an interesting work. Uh, Andy and Anushka Parrish, members of the company, uh, had a child and five years later, five and a half years later to be precise, discovered uh, that the child had autism. It was, and uh, it was a shock. And as they talk about in the program notes and the conversations I've had with them, uh, it had a seismic effect on them. And that's an understatement. And the scenes that I watched and the conversations that I've had with them, and uh, it's, we've been having conversations with Hunter College and everything, we may get involved in some ways, and I as a dramaturg may certainly get involved just because of my past relationships with Moises and everything and some of the notes I've already been giving and talking about and passing on this book of, of David Eagleman's Incognito, which is an extraordinary book about the subconscious and, and uh, he's a neuroscientist and everything. Uh, we had lots of discussions about uh, the core of this piece. One of the very first things I said watching this in the post-play discussion was, and I didn't, I didn't focus on, oh, isn't this interesting, this uh, child, you know, uh, the, the, the victim. I didn't focus on that. My initial comment was, I'm fascinated by, and they had this term in the program, the neuronormal people and their seismic outsized responses. It seems, it seems to me that's the event. That's the event to track. That that's really interesting. And and that the child, you know, is you know interesting and everything, but it's that other thing that's that's, that's particularly difficult. And I, from my own personal background, um, my own family. Had a uh, uh, my brother had a uh, and sister in law. Uh, I grew up in a farming community out in South Dakota, uh, you know, years ago. And, uh, I mean, it was it was it was different. That's all I can say. You know, I know I'm Mr. Yale, but I came from another place. I went to a one room schoolhouse for eight years. I was the only child in my class for eight years. My aunt was my teacher. Tells you where I came from. And uh, my my brother. They had a child during the German measles outbreak, and for three years, uh, they didn't know he was deaf, the child. And, it, and it, when they found out, it created a seismic event in my family, is all I can tell you. And I shared this with Andy and Anushka, and I said, so I understand. I understand, I understand, I understand. 
And this play goes beyond being about autism. It goes beyond a lot of those kinds of events in families. And so I'm very interested in this play. I'm also very interested in another play, and this will seem like hardly what you would call fringe or cutting edge. I saw this amazing little play at the Signature Theater uh, by Bill Irwin, David Scheider, called Old Hats. I don't know if any of you saw this. New vaudeville. Uh, and again, it's about, is a, is a lesson to me about don't judge, don't judge, don't judge. Uh, you think, oh, Bill Irwin, clown, vaudeville. And I went and saw it, and I, and I knew somebody else in it, Nellie Mackay, who always, you know, she's a, a, a neo-feminist uh, performer. She always shows up with a little flower in her hair and everything, a ukulele, and, a, and a, 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 you know, plays the piano. And at any rate, uh, so Bill Irwin and David Shiner showed up on this big signature theater stage, glossy stage and everything, but with Wendell Harrington's extraordinary or futuristic uh, uh, projections. And my God, did he take us, they take us on this amazing uh, journey. And I, all I can describe it as, it was a collision, a surrealistic collision of vaudeville, neo-feminism, and uh, and at one point, so that, you know, here you have um, uh, Nellie Mackay walking around playing a ukulele and singing a love song going, I hope you still love me, because if you don't, I'll slit your throat. <laughs> <laughs> and then on stage, you got Bill Irwin and, uh, and uh, David Shiner doing all of their vaudeville things and clown routines, and suddenly these amazing projections of Wendell Harrington's will kick in and they'll suddenly disappear into a slit of a projection and that is reminiscent, uh, an echo of Buster Keaton's Sherlock Jr. Where suddenly the central character, you know, Buster Keaton, will suddenly walk down the aisle and disappear into the screen and, and suddenly find himself in this surrealistic landscape in the past and, and suddenly keep dropping, you know, into one nightmarish thing after another, after another, and where the, where you, your foot touches something and boom, it's a trap door into another nightmarish realm, another nightmarish realm, another nightmarish realm. And my God, I thought I was just going to the Signature Theater. <laughs> and I love the Signature Theater, but I didn't expect this. You know, this I didn't expect. So, old hats, a little vaudeville turn, and, and whatever the reviews said, you know, you're gonna love this, it'll be sweet, but look, well, I think they missed the point. <laughs> because I was seeing Sherlock Jr. and talk about 1900 and 2013. I mean, past, present, future, all over the place. It was great. Yeah. And that excited me. That's so great. That's so exciting. I mean, what, what's, you know, twigging for me as you're talking is, we, we keep talking about change, we keep talking about change, and I'm, I'm a little reluctant about, you know, let's not just throw everything out so that we can go forward to the new thing. And one of the things that we've, you know, that I learned of working in, uh, in Aboriginal practice in, with some of the artists, the amazing artists that I work, is to accept and acknowledge that we bring it all to the room, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's Turtle Gals Performance Ensemble, which existed for a decade, the almost concurrent with my tenure at Native Earth, it wasn't my fault uh, that they broke up. Uh, but they did three really important, astonishing shows, which is one of the reasons that I have to write about them. Uh, and the first one was called The Scrubbing Project, and they they brought everything to it. The shape of the of the show, it's uh, well, it's it's impossible to explain. The shape of the show is kind of a ceremony for the dead, uh, a feast for the dead. Uh, you don't really know that unless you're me or Lisa or Tara, <laughs> like uh, unless you're indigenous, really. Uh, you can uh, you can apprehend that over the course of the show, but. They brought everything to it. Like they're all breeds of some sort. Uh, Janie calls herself a Findian, so she's Finnish and Aboriginal Findian. Uh, Monique and Michelle both have Jewish heritage, so they bring that to the room. Everybody brings everything to the room, but they also brought vaudeville and they brought 
powwow and they brought and there's a there's a moment near the end of the play where they're singing somewhere over the rainbow powwow <laughs> style and it's absolutely transcendent mm. it's amazing and so it's it was and that was the first show out of the shoot when i came to native earth they were it was already in production and i was like wow okay so we it all it all comes with us which of course it does i mean in in indigenous worldview you know, we do this at Native Earth, like all those who came before and all those who come after, and this is where you are in the continuum, right? I'm here and I'm responsible to these people and to these people, even if I don't have any of these, these real, like, blood people, but I still am responsible to every, all of this. And, and part of that responsibility means bringing all of my stuff to the room and not putting it down, which is one of the reasons why we fail so miserably in conservatory programs, because one of the things they ask you is to like, be stripped away mm -hmm. and then rebuilt into an actor <coughs> thing. And that won't work for us, because mm -hmm. it, you, we've, been, we've been being stripped away for 500 years. I'm tired of being stripped away. I need to hang on to all of my stuff and bring that into the work with me. Um, so hearing you talk about Old Hat is like, yeah, of course we bring vaudeville into the 21st century. Of course we bring our traditions and our practices all into the work with us. And in that way do we become whole again in a, as a community. In that way do, do we become whole again, not just in this community, but in this community and in this community too out there in TV land, mm -hmm. web land. Um, the, and that's the thing that I keep hearing in this conference all weekend is about connection, connection, making connection, mm -hmm. reconnecting. And the book that I'm writing about Native theater, I, the, the epiphany I had is like, it's medicine. Everything is medicine. Joe Boy had said, I'm sorry, Joseph Boyden, if you're listening, Joseph Boyden had said, every act, every trap line I walk, every paddle, every tea I have with my aunties, all of these are acts of medicine. And, and I was lying in yoga going, so if, we're, if all of these are acts of medicine, then what we're doing in the theater is also, these are also acts of medicine, and therefore maybe I'll just call the book Medicine Shows. And as I said last night, it was like, like a spiritual chiropractic, and I went, oh, right, okay. And then the, you know, the, the definition of medicine in, in my culture is not about curing something, it's about...